Welcome, I'm Pastor Janine from the Odell and Cornell United Methodist Churches. It's great to be with you today. I've got a little campfire burning. I hope you don't get smoked out. How many love history? History can help us from making the same mistakes over and over again. Our warning today comes from the prophet Amos. He was saying that the Israelites couldn't wait for the Sabbath to be over so they could get back to their real passion, making money. Worship was just a habit, an empty ritual, because in their hearts they were plotting how to profit in deceitful ways, cheating their customers with scales that were rigged. So the Lord said, since they had no appetite for hearing the word of the Lord or hear hurting heeding it, he would take the Bible away. There would be a famine of hearing the word. The one thing we need is to feast on God's word. Today we have numerous Bibles in our homes, the Bibles on our smartphones, but do we reach for it as often as we download bestsellers or play games or apps or um, Facebook? There are churches on practically every corner, but crime and hunger are also around every corner. Amos is warning those who turn their hearts from God, just like our generation needs to turn their hearts back to God. You see, we have the bread of life, but we're not sharing it. We feast while others starve for the hope that is in the gospel. Who would have thought our church services would suddenly be taken away? Yet, we have the Bible on the internet and Zoom services, but in the future, what if our internet and Bible are taken away? So take advantage of this golden opportunity to be growing in the Word and teaching yourself and your children and grandchildren God's Word when we still can. And remember, they can never take God or Jesus away from us. Sadly, some are saying they will never come back to church, but that is a bad example to set for their kids and grandkids who need Jesus. Now let's skip over to the reading in Luke. We're familiar with this passage. It shows Martha as a suffering servant and Mary as the sitting saint. Everyone has different gifts or talents. God has his Mary's and Martha's, his John's as well as his Paul's. But when Jesus stopped by their house that day, it was going to be his last trip. He was on his way to Jerusalem to die. He just wanted to talk it over with his friends. Martha was so anxious and worried about many things, the menu, the table setting, the cleanup, etc. I can also be guilty of this, but Jesus had many things to tell her. Many things fill up our agendas just like many dishes fill up our stomachs. We can get lost in a flurry of good activity, but what about filling our souls? Martha welcomed Jesus as a significant guest in her home, but failed to let his words into her heart at that moment. First, Martha was distracted. She probably sat down a few minutes to chat, but her mind was on the roast in the oven and making sure the bread didn't burn. She decided dinner was more important and excused herself from the teacher. But rather than whistling while she worked, she became depressed, feeling as if she had to do everything by herself. Loss of focus caused her to resort to self-pity instead of enjoying the chance to serve Jesus. She was operating out of a sense of duty rather than devotion. It had become all about her. When trying to cram too many things or activities into a given period, a critical spirit develops and we begin to judge and condemn others for what they do or don't do. Now she becomes disapproving of both Mary and Jesus and says, Lord, why don't you make her help me? Don't you care? Now what did Jesus do? Did he tell Mary to go help her sister? Sure, they would need to appreciate the meal, but a simple sandwich would be fine this time. Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, 
which will not be taken away from her. You see the passage in Amos warning them that there would be a famine of hearing the word of the Lord, not a famine for food, but a famine for God's word. It's the same thing as Jesus is trying to get across to Martha. He's saying, look, Martha, you don't know it, but I'm going to be scarcer than a five course meal around here pretty soon. Let me serve you. Feed on my words. I'm the one thing you need. The physical food we eat, to eat today will be gone quickly, but the spiritual food Mary is taking in will remain in her heart when I am gone. You see, we think being busy means we're doing something important and downtime is wasted. Are we like Martha and the people in Amos's day, too distracted with busyness and business to hear God? When we're offered the chance to hear a word from God, we just can't spare the time. Man's frantic search for meaning in life and for acquiring many luxuries and novelties are really efforts to find the one thing for which we're created, to know God, to love and enjoy God and others, and to glorify God. Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, Matthew 4, 4. There are values beyond bread that give meaning and effectiveness to our lives. John 6:48 tells us that Jesus is the bread of life, and anyone who eats living bread lives forever, John 6:51. So that is the needful thing, eternal life, not just daily life. Jesus is saying, I am the main course for today. Martha rushed and fussed and cooked and is trying to impress Jesus, but physical food was not on his mind that day. Physical company was, and that's what so many grieving and lonely people need to be brought close to God, point them to God. When we are sick, food doesn't appeal to us, but family and friends are like medicine. Sometimes we need to quit being a human doing and just be a human being. Jesus used the story of the Good Samaritan to show how we can um, give love to our neighbors and serve one another. Then he used the story of Mar Martha and Mary to show how we should love God and serve him. Martha lost her focus of Jesus while Mary couldn't take her eyes off of him. Jesus is our everything. We must ask ourselves if Christ is just prominent in our lives or number one. Jesus is not just important, but he's essential. In the final passage, the Colossians didn't believe that God created the world. They didn't believe that Christ came to earth in bodily form, and they didn't believe he was the unique son of God. So if you take all of that away, you're left with a pretty lame personality rather than God himself. Paul wrote the passage in our reading from Colossians to refute those beliefs. It describes who Jesus really is. Jesus is Lord over all creatures and the creation. He himself was not created, but is from everlasting to everlasting. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He laid aside his divine position in heaven and became human for our sakes. He is the very image of God. Hebrews 1.3 says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. This always reminds me of the teacher who asked the little boy what his drawing was, and he said, I'm drawing a picture of God. But the teacher argued, no one has ever seen God, so we don't really know what he looks like. Continuing to draw, the little boy replied, they will when I'm finished. In him, all things hold together. Isn't that good to know? Heaven is never in crisis. And he is the head of the body of the church, for God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We realize that even our country's peace is bought with someone else's blood. There are 624 acres of tombstones in Arlington Cemetery bringing you freedom and peace. 
And because Jesus died in your place, there is peace with God for you, and eternity awaits. God is not mad at you or counting your sins against you. Verses 21 through 22 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish or accusation. The one thing that is needful for you to hear him say is he has forgiven you and your guilt is taken away. Right here in Colossians 1, the Bible says when you die, he's going to present you as holy and blameless to the Father. Now that's really amazing because you know how we are and holy and blameless is not the way you would describe yourself or myself to anyone, much less to God. But that's what Jesus' death did for you. So now I want you to turn to whoever's sitting beside you this morning and say, I am holy and blameless. Go ahead, do it right now and say it like you know it. Please settle that in your heart and mind today. I'm continually saddened to hear Christians say, I hope I'm gonna make it to heaven. You can know that you are. This passage says God will hold nothing against you because of Jesus. He is all you need. The word all is used seven times in this one passage. And the number seven in the Bible always represents the idea of completion. This is good news worth hearing today. Listen, Jesus can get a meal together on the spur of the moment anytime. He fed the multitudes. He fed the fishermen when they had caught nothing all night. Physical food is needed for a physical life, but one thing is needed for a spiritual life. Jesus has prepared it. It is his body broken as bread for you. It is, it's his blood poured out like wine for you. Take it, eat it, feast on it for a famished heart. Amen. See you next week.